Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Can I tell you something? What we choose to do, how we use our free will, tells more about us than any other single thing. Because what I choose is the core of me. What I choose shows my character. I, for about three years, I had it really strongly on my heart to teach people how to live on purpose and to, to live on purpose for a purpose. And so I've written a book that we're calling Seize the Day. I'm sure many of you have heard that statement, carpe diem. Well, that's what it means, seize the day. And it basically means learn how to live your life on purpose and not just get up and kind of float through the day and wait to see what happens. Are you one of those people that ever have a lot of plans in the morning? And you mean well, and by the time you go to bed at night, you know you were busy all day, but you don't have a clue what you did. <laughs> you didn't really get hardly anything that you wanted to get accomplished, accomplished. Well, to be honest, that's because you're letting all kinds of circumstances seize you. And we always say, well, I just had so many interruptions. Well, the truth is, is you Let yourself get interrupted. <laughs> hey Amen. One person way over there likes that. <laughs> Thank you. It's encouraging. And, uh, and I do it too. You know, it's like we don't have to answer the phone just because it rings. We don't have to stop what we're doing and talk to somebody for 30 minutes about something we're not even interested in just because they choose that time to want to talk to us. And you're not being mean if you start saying, I need to live my life on purpose and I need to put it into the purpose for which God is calling me to. And so it's time for us to take our lives back. Amen? It's time to just stop letting everything around us dictate what we're going to do. I want to start with Ephesians 5, verse 14. Thank you, Lord, for the word tonight. I pray that you would use it to impact people in many different ways. Different people are going to hear lots of different things. And I thank you for speaking to everybody, including me, in Jesus' name. Ephesians 5, 14 through 17 are a group of scriptures that have always impressed me. They have a lot of meaning in them. Remember now, before I start this, that he was talking to the church at Ephesus. He was talking to born-again people. He says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. I wonder how that would be to start a conference. <laughs> Wake up, you sleepy Christians, and arise from the dead. But you know, sometimes that's the truth. We just kind of go through life, and we go through church, and we go to church, and We can stop being excited about God and stop being excited about our lives and stop being excited about everything if we don't learn to live life on purpose and be happy on purpose and have joy on purpose and have peace on purpose. Amen. Yeah. See, now, not everybody's like this, but I think that there's a lot of people who just sit around and wait for something to come to them all the time. Well, I wish. Well, I wish I felt happy. Well, I wish I had your life. I wish I was more disciplined. I wish I would have been working out for the last 30 years. <laughs> okay, if you don't remember anything else, please remember this. You get nothing by wishing for it. <laughs> Tell the person next to you that. You get nothing by wishing for it. How many of you agree with me that there's an awful lot of people like that in the world? They're just kind of sitting back waiting for something good to happen to them, and they're not doing anything to cooperate with it. Now, like I said, you're not all like that, but if you're an aggressive person who does get up every day and sees your day, then you can just sit there smugly and say, ah, finally I'm hearing a message that I'm already doing. 
Therefore, he says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine and make day dawn upon you and give you light. Look carefully, then, how you walk. <laughs> carefully. The word carefully in the Greek is to walk circumspectly. And that means to walk looking all around you all the time as if you're in a very dangerous place. <laughs> Matter of fact, Pastor Mike was telling me that he studied it out a little bit further and it gives some kind of a word picture of be like a person walking barefoot in a field of thorns. How carefully would you walk? I mean, you'd be very but see, I don't think we're careful enough sometimes. The Bible says the devil roams about like a lion, roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone whom he may devour. He can't devour just anybody he wants to, but sleepy Christians, <laughs> people that aren't being careful about how they live. Let, let me give you an example. How many of you uh, have been offended in the past seven days? Okay, that was a thorn. <laughs> and if you would have been living carefully enough, you would have thought, eh, I know what that is. And I'm not stepping on that. Not again. Been there, done that. See, so many things that happened to us are the devil trying to steal from us. Whether he's trying to steal a moment or an hour or a day or our life or our joy or our peace. He roams about like a lion, roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. We need to live more carefully. Look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately. Not as the unwise and the witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people. And now I love this. Making the most, making the very most of the time. Buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. You know, don't ever let the miracle of the moment pass you by. Be the kind of person who's watching to see how God wants to use you and watching to see what God wants to do. And even if it's giving somebody what to you could be just a little tiny compliment to them, it could be a life-changing thing or it could change their day around. Let's don't let opportunities pass us by to be used by God. And let's don't, let's don't let opportunities pass us by to be obedient to God. Let's don't be the kind of people that God's got to deal with us three weeks before we finally get around to doing what God tells us to do. Amen? Amen. We're going to talk some in the next three sessions about waste. And we're going to talk a lot about time. You see, every day that goes by in your life is one you're not ever going to get back. <laughs> and so we can either waste our time or we can invest our time. Resting is not wasting your time. We need to do that. Having fun is not wasting your time. We need to do that. But do you know every hour that you spend angry is a total waste of time? Every 15 minutes that you spend in self-pity is a waste of time. Every 10 minutes that you spend worried, it's a, nothing's ever accomplished through worry. It makes nothing better. Being mad at people don't make them change. Half the time, they're out having a good time and couldn't even care less that you're mad. The devil roams about like a lion roaring in fierce hunger, seeking whom he may devour. We need to live like wise, intelligent, 
people, not as the witless people who don't know what they're doing. We need to learn the word and then pray. I don't care if we have to pray a hundred times a day. God, help me do what you tell me to do in this word. Help me stop living like a sleepy Christian that's got a blindfold on, walking around out in the world, not paying any attention to the attacks of the enemy. How many of you believe tonight with me that if you lived a little more carefully and opened your eyes just a little bit wider, that you could save yourself a lot of trouble, probably daily in your life? So that's kind of what this is going to be all about. We're going to be smarter when this is over. Therefore, verse 17, do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. Now, here we come down to it. Probably 50, 60% of the church, maybe more, would say, well, that's my problem. I just don't know what God's will is. I'm just waiting. <laughs> See, there we have it. <laughs> Come on, I don't even need to go any further for some of you. I'm just waiting to see what God wants me to do. <laughs> Come on. If I could just hear from God. Well, you know what? God can't drive a parked car. <laughs> Maybe you just need to start going in some direction. You know, waiting on God is not a ministry. <laughs> Now, the Bible talks about waiting on God, but it's not the kind of waiting that we do. It's not like waiting, doing nothing to see if God ever wants you to do anything. You know, when I first felt the call of God on my life, I mean, I did anything that was available to do at my church. And a lot of it I wasn't right for me. It, I wasn't anointed for it. One of the things I did was I went out with a group of people and passed out gospel tracts on the streets of St. Louis, and I hated it. <laughs> hated it. I am not a street preacher. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't like it. And then I tried working in the nursery at church, and that only lasted a week, and me and the kids knew that weren't right. I tried the helps ministry, and I'm sorry, but that's not me either. I want to be helped. <laughs> you know what? I'm a leader. I was born to teach. And when I started opening my mouth and doing that, ah, now that worked. <laughs> that worked. And see... You got to start moving and doing something till you find what fits. And sometimes at different times in your life, maybe something you've been doing for a long time doesn't seem to be fitting right anymore. You know what? I made a decision this past year. I'm not, now, when I say I'm not going to be married to anything but Dave, I mean, we get married to our plan. Come on. Well, that's the way I've always done it, so that's the way I've got to do it. And especially when you're in ministry and you've been in a ministry for a long time, you got this system and you're working your system and you're doing what you do. And, you know, you can get married to your plans and not even hear what God's trying to say to you. You know, God, listen to me. God doesn't care how long you've been doing something the same way. If he wants to change it, what you've been doing won't work anymore. <laughs> Amen. Life would be so exciting if we would really learn how to follow the leadership and the guidance of the Holy Spirit instead of worshiping our plan and sitting around waiting somewhere for God to show us what we need to do. God will show you, but you got to be ready to move when he says move. Now, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about God's will and man's will. God has a will, 
for each of us, something that he has preordained for us to do. But the fact that he's preordained it doesn't mean that it's going to automatically happen. Sometime over the next three sessions, we're going to look at a scripture that talks about how God has laid out a good plan, predestined and predetermined a good plan for every one of our lives. That includes you. A good plan. Not a mediocre plan. Not a halfway plan. A good plan. And it says he's laid it out that we might walk in it. That you might walk in it. See, God says, I've, this is what I've determined. Now, do you want it? I love what he told Joshua. Every place on which the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I already given unto you. God's already got all kinds of stuff prepared for you, but now you've got to start finding out what it is and moving into it. And let me tell you something. When you start doing the will of God, everybody you know may not clap and cheer. Now, whoever needed that can just have that. Now, now I want to say something to you, and this is kind of what I'm trying to get around to in this series of teachings. What God has a will for us, but he's also given us a free will. And God gave us a free will because he loves us. And love demands that you give the person you love freedom of choice. Love is not love if people are manipulated and forced. Somebody might say, well, if God knew the choices we were going to make, then why didn't he put us in a world where there was no evil and there was no tragedy and, and just so we could just have a happy life? Well, actually, the truth is he did. <laughs> That's kind of the way it started, if you've forgotten that. The garden was a great place. And so somebody might say, well, why didn't he just make us so we couldn't sin? Because that's not love. And we couldn't love God back if we didn't have to choose to love him and choose to obey him. And the world is messed up, not because God is mean, but because people do dumb things. Amen? And even if we don't do dumb things, we're always getting other dumb things that people do in our path, and we have to deal with their dumb things. And when you have enough dumb things going on in the world like we've got going on today, it gets to the point where it's just confronting everybody all the time. But you have a free will. And I don't know that we teach enough about man's free will in church. I don't know when, the, I don't know, I don't know if I've ever heard a full a whole message on you have a free will. Can I tell you something? What we choose to do how we use our free will tells more about us than any other single thing. Because what I choose is the core of me. What I choose shows my character. It's deeper than what I feel. It's more than what I think. It's a deeper thing to say, well, I don't feel like doing that and I don't think it's a good idea, but I will because God told me to. Well, I tell you what, if we worship feelings, we're already down the drain before we ever get started. You use your will to choose God's will. And I want to be careful how I teach this because there are many things that cannot be done by willpower alone. You cannot save yourself by willpower. Amen. And there, there are many things that we cannot do no matter how much willpower we have. There's no way that I could build a ministry like this just because I willed it to be so. But then here's the other thing. God couldn't build something like this either if I didn't put my will with his. 
and take the steps of faith and pay the price. And so the Bible says with men, many things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So now here's the thing, and, and I just, I just kind of wrote this down today. There's a great many things that you and I cannot do without God. There are things that we can't do without God. But there's also many things that God won't do without you. See, I, I, I know I gotta go slow. This is, we're at a new gate here tonight. You know what? God put lumber in trees, but God doesn't build a house. The man goes and cuts down the tree and he prepares the lumber and he gets it somewhere and he builds the house. God provides everything that we need, including the wisdom and the strength and the grace and the power to do it, but he doesn't do the doing for us. He does it with us. Come on. I've been waiting to see who I could try this message on, so I hope I got the right group. Because see, I think, I think that we can get into this, well, God, will you do this? God, I'm waiting on you to do this. I was praying for somebody one time that had a need. God, provide this need, provide for them. And he said, stop asking me to do things for people that you could do yourself and just don't want to. Yeah. I mean, if a person you work with is sleeping on the floor and doesn't have a mattress, do you really need to pray for God to give them a mattress? Why don't you just get some money out and go buy a mattress? Oh, I, I, I can't afford that, and they're not even a believer anyway. Well, that's the best person to give it to, somebody that will just be amazed that you actually have some fruit <laughs> to back up your bumper sticker. <laughs> Amen? Now, so I'm going to kind of show you, I hope this will show you how this works, because I'm in no way saying that we can just by willpower go do a bunch of stuff. We can do nothing without God. We can do nothing without Him. So I believe it kind of works like this. I see something that God wants me to do, and I say, I will do that. By the grace and the mercy of God, I will do that. And then God gives me the strength to do it because I have said that I want to do it. I want to do what he wants me to do. And then sometimes all the way through it, I have to keep praying that. You don't think I got up here tonight without praying that God would use me and without praying that God would give me the right word for you. I'm not that stupid. I know that I can't get up here, but nonetheless, I did have to get up here. I did have to show up. I did have to study. I did have to do my part. Amen? And I think the point that I'm trying to make for people is we need to realize we are partners with God. We have a part and He has a part. We cannot do His part and He will not do our part. Well, learn to live life on purpose, take control of your day, and use godly wisdom to manage your resources, especially your most important resource, which is your time. It's a gift from God, so don't waste it.
meer dan 10 miljoen gevangenen zitten wereldwijd vast. It's a hostile territory prison. And I'm speaking proof of that. Zij die achter zulke muren leven zijn mensen. En Jezus vraagt ons om naar hen om te kijken. I'm here for third degree burglary. I have a lengthy sentence of 400 months. The judge looked at me and said, I'm going to sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life plus 20 years behind these prison walls. A lot of people don't have family here, so they feel forgotten. There's not a lot of people beating the door down to get in here to see us. That outreach of the hand to touch their lives in a personal way, to, to come visit them, to, to see that somebody is really thinking about them, that somebody cares for them on the outside. You're giving to people that really are like at the bottom of the totem pole. And with your giving, that, uh, that's actually bringing somebody up. It's the fact that you thought about us, even if it was just to come by and have prayer. We just feel loved, you know, that we're not pieces of garbage, you know, um, thrown away, um, that somebody does value us still, and that there is hope, there's hope for us. Tot nu toe hebben we meer dan 3600 gevangenissen bezocht. Zijn er meer dan 3 miljoen cadeautasjes uitgedeeld. En meer dan 139.000 gevangenen hebben voor hun leven met Jezus gekozen. Iedere dag worden we door vele stemmen, gedachten en meningen overspoeld. Hoe kunnen we erachter komen wat God ons door bepaalde levensvragen en dagelijkse uitdagingen zeggen wil? Joyce Meyer legt in dit boek uit op welke verschillende manieren God met je kan communiceren. Bestel nu hoe je Gods stem kunt horen telefonisch op 026... 20 22 100 of bezoek onze website joyce-meyer.nl Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meyer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard.